Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Victoire. I am your host, Emir. Before I begin today's broadcast, I ask that you kindly subscribe to our channel, like, and share our videos. It helps us spread these inspirational stories much, much further. Today's guest will be a first for Victoire. This is the very first female professional wrestler to ever appear on the show, and she is quite the sensation. Having made tidal waves in the WWE, TNA, AEW, and New Japan. She was also a star of the Netflix TV series, Glow. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the amazing Kong. Victoire. Victoire gives a special thanks to the EWF and Mr. Jesse Hernandez, along with SoCal Wrestling TV, Find the app available on... Sponsored by California's own Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market for all your organic produce, healthy foods, and supplement needs. A tattoo is for life. So look no further than the trusted tattoo company and mobile body art bus, one of the most reputable tattoo companies in all of Southern California. Live near the San Diego area, looking to become a pro wrestler? Then contact Primal Pro Wrestling. Unleash your inner primal. 619-971-1445. Interested in pro wrestling memorabilia? Would you like to meet some of your favorite stars? Then contact The Wrestling Guy Store at www.therestlingguystore.com. Alternatively, two store locations, Huntington Park, California and Phoenix, Arizona. Palm Springs, California, Indian Wells, California, Rancho Mirage, California. They're all considered a destination hotspot, a second home haven. With an exquisite record of negotiating the finest deals for clients, Lowell Folsom III and Associates always deliver. Contact Lowell today at 760-391-2504. Now, on with the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Victoire. I have the pleasure today of sitting down and having a conversation with Kia Stevens. You better know her as Awesome Kong, Amazing Kong. She is here today. She is a legend in the world of professional wrestling. Kia, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kia, you've got quite the story. You've you've traveled the world You've been in Hollywood, you've done it, you've been there, done it, and got the t-shirt. But for those who don't know, and for the, and maybe a story that you've never shared before, let's go back in time and talk about how you got to that place where you wanted to be a pro wrestler. Um, so maybe your, your childhood, you, some of your, maybe some of your dreams and aspirations then, how they changed and kind of the things that you dealt with growing up prior to becoming a pro wrestler. Let's start there. Um, well, I, I want to contribute something that maybe people haven't heard me say in other interviews. Um, me growing up as a kid, I was very, very quiet, like a mute, basically, but I always watched what was going on. I was extremely shy. Yeah. Um, I had an outgoing sister and I had a rambunctious little brother. And so I was the middle child and all that comes with it. But uh, with a rambunctious little brother who was like the little brother in Super Fudge, but way, way worse, um, with him teasing and, and, and just getting on my nerves, we could never really get along, but we got along when we watched wrestling. Yeah. And that is because he used to torment me by putting me in the um, Boston Crab and then um, he loved the Iron Sheik, so he would always put me in uh, Iron Sheik's, you know, yeah. lock. And then I thought to myself, if I don't want to be his, you know, bitch, basically, I'm going to need to learn how to wrestle. So I went upstairs, watched a few Saturdays on wrestling, and when he came at me next, I, I reversed it, yeah. which surprised him because I never would stick up for myself, like, ever. I was, like, the house pushover. Yeah. Glam. <laughs> and after that, 
we had a respect for one another and we would just watch wrestling every every Saturday and we loved well and we would love to hate the tag team Hollywood and Vine together. Those, those were the best conversations my brother and I ever had to this day about how much we love to hate Hollywood and Vine. So I had always thought put, you know, other girls put ballerina as, you know, when when you're at school and the teacher asks, what do you want to be when you grow up? Girls say ballerina, people say teacher, astronaut, X, Y, and Z, cowboy. I wanted to be a wrestler. Yeah. Having a mother that was in Hollywood, my mom was an actress, later director, and a contestant coordinator. Oh, okay. She wanted to discourage me from, you know, really pursuing a career and wrestling in particular, because from what she understood, a lot of those girls had to put time in on the casting couch in order to go anywhere. And so when she shared that with me, that stuck in my brain for a really, really long time. Yeah. But still, I asked Santa Claus to make me a glow girl one day. Yeah. And it, it took him 30 some odd years, but eventually, you know, he did. Yeah. But uh, in, in between there, there's been, you know, watching wrestling on and off. But when I was in my 20s, I, I got around a, a group of friends who were really into wrestling, and I started watching wrestling again, and it kind of stuck. And when Trish Stratus started wrestling, yeah. if you remember when Trish first started, huh. she wasn't that good. Actually, she was terrible. She gave yeah. away the business. I love you, Trish, but... <laughs> And I thought, if, well, if she could do it, I could do it. Yeah. And, but she went on to become the one of the most, one of my favorite wrestlers. I mean, you know, catch her now. You can't yeah. catch, you can catch the business on her now. And so, but she became an inspiration. Her seeing Lita do flips off the rope, seeing Joni, seeing China come out there and own it. I'm like, I want to be like one of these women. Yeah. And so I pursued, I started to look into how you actually become a wrestler without putting time in on the casting couch. Right, right. Now, but during that time, Kia, were there any other interests? Like, as you said, you stopped watching wrestling for a little bit. Did your interest go in any other directions at all? Well, uh, like I said, my mom was in Hollywood and I was a child actress. She would always put us in movies, and get parts, plays, drama, whatnot. So I thought my initial official like plan, you know, in high school, when you talk to your counselor was either from junior high school to go to Hollywood High and um, try out for their magnet program okay. or to go to Juilliard. Okay. However, it did not work out. Um, my mom didn't want me, you know, she's a very protective mother. <laughs> She didn't want me going, uh, catching the bus way up to Hollywood. She wanted me to go to Carson High. That's where I grew up in, in Carson, California. Right. Um, and she wanted me to go to Carson High, which I did. Um, one of the best schools in the world, really multicultural. Um, and Juilliard just kind of fell by the wayside because I started um, thinking I would do other things. And accounting, actually. Accounting. came to mind. Um, there was a bunch of accounting classes that I took in high school and they were like my major elective and I fell in love with accounting and I said, I'm going to be an accountant. And okay. then that didn't work out. And next thing you know, I'm a social worker. Hold on, I got something in my eye. Next thing you know, I'm a social worker because I love kids oh. and I still do. Um, Camp Hollywoodland, being a counselor uh, at Camp Hollywoodland was one of the best jobs i ever had was that and when was that was that around your high school college college time that was during my college year so between 1997 to 2000 oh. early 2000s i started wrestling in 2002 okay 2002 yeah no that's wonderful one of the things that springs to mind obviously you know at that point you know, a lot of women, well, guys too, you know, you're dating, you're thinking about families and things like that. Was that something that you thought about at that time or were you solely driven on getting into the business? Well, I mean, I always had a man. I was like, I'm not a boyfriend, I am. But my plan after, you know, I thought really to take my entertainment career seriously, I'm like, I want to do something that is wild and crazy because at the time I was making really good money. I had went on with Will Fortune, 
one over 10 grand with that 10 grand. I bought myself a vending machine business okay. and I um, was a director at a nonprofit program called LA Shanti and they were like paying me good money. So I was 23, 24 years old making six figures. And I'm like, well, if I could do this at 20, 23, 24, I can do this later. These are my 20s. I, you know, I shouldn't be doing inventory on a Friday, Saturday night. I should be out there ripping it up. I want to tell my kids and my nieces and nephews that I went out there and lived. I want to go out and have one of those traveling trunks that has all the traveling stickers on there. You know, I yeah. want to uh, share said something once on, on, on Oprah that all this stuff with me to live life feels all off. Mm -hmm. I live my twenties and most of my thirties, I can tell you how old I am now, but until the wheels fell off, I have very little regrets of how I live my life. In the 20s and 30s. Yeah. And I took the chance because, you know, many people said, are you crazy? Look at you. You're not the, the typical cookie cutter kind of people that they're going to accept. All the odds are against you. And I'm like, well, if you don't know me, bring it on. Yeah. Even better. So when I succeed, that's even a better accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you made a tremendous, you know, your career is stellar. You know, when you look back at everything you did, what is it? Just over 20 years, your career was in the business, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, so walk us back then to that initial uh, training camp there. So when you first discovered the school, obviously you trained under Jesse Hernandez. All right, the school, yes, School of Hard Knocks. School of Hard Knocks. We got to give Jesse, you know, he's a great guy, great teacher, wonderful guy, wonderful mind for the business. So you started training there in San Bernardino. How did you um, get accustomed to it? Was it easy for your body to adjust to all the, the, the bumps and everything? Well, um when you grow up, like I said, in entertainment and acting, when you have a career in that already, that comes with uh, dance, choreography, uh, gymnastics, you know, uh, all of that. So having had a cheerleading background and a drill team background and a dance background and a gymnastics background and a sports background in, in general, um, taking to the choreography um, I would say I picked it up, at least that's what Jesse said, I picked it up rather swiftly than some that walked through the door. Okay, all right. So that was an easy transition. And then how long did it take before you started going out and having matches so you were ring ready? Well, when I walked through Jesse, I didn't find Jesse, actually. I went on a show. I, I tried out for Tough Enough. MTV's Tough Enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember that's when um, one of my best friends in the world who I love, Mr. Jim Ross, said I would never make you nothing. I got to prove you wrong. <laughs> and I went and found another show called Discovery Health uh, Body Challenge. Uh, Discovery Channel had a show called uh, Body Challenge. And it was kind of like The Biggest Loser, but way before The Biggest Loser came out. Okay. So um, I went out for that show and I got it. And they're the ones, they asked me my goals and what I wanted to do. I let them know, you know, I want to be a wrestler. I just got rejected in the biggest way. Help me. And they, they're they the ones that found the school for me. Okay. And I used to have to get up and from L.A., Hollywood, and drive all the way out to San Bernardino after working, you know, maintaining my business and, and working eight hours, ten hours a day. It was a hard road. But I was like dedicated. I said, yeah. I'm spending five years. I gave myself five years to make it. Okay. And like go hard five years and then see where you're at. And yeah. running, it took me three months. Hey, what? Wow. Three months, Kia? Wow. <laughs> oh, well, three months. And I, I'm, I'm just being silly now, but no, three months and then I, I went to Japan. Yeah. Okay. Gosh. Yeah. But still, that's pretty fast to go to Japan. So, so at that time, I mean, obviously your, your mind's got to be blown at that point. Three months and now you're off to Japan. Um, what was it like, uh, cultural, you know, the culture shock for you? Did you find it easy to adjust to their, their way of life over there? No, not at all. I found it very different. And I mean, I have to say as an American, as an arrogant American, uh, I found that I learned that I was arrogant. Okay. I learned that I learned that I was an arrogant American and I thought that doing things the American way was the only way to do things. And I learned that to appreciate other cultures and there are different ways of doing things. And I feel so blessed to have had that ignorance 
shown to me that mirror held up. Yeah. You know, and, no, things are different. Yes, doesn't mean that it's wrong. I learned a lot by my friends and family in Japan. And I call that home. Yeah, yeah. So you made new friends and family. Did uh, did you have a, a boyfriend, a husband uh, at the time that came with you, or were you you still solo at that time? Oh, give me a second. Okay. Okay. I'm about to cry. Hold on. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Sure. You just made me remember something, and it made me cry. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right, Kia. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, well, actually, um, I had a boyfriend named Dave that I met at um, one of the places that I had one of my vending machines. And that relationship, it just wasn't working out. We weren't in the same place. Uh, so I had to, like, you know, break it off because I'm ambitious and I have plans. And it just seems like... Um, we were just in different places in our lives. So I'm like, get it together or ship ship out. And he couldn't get it together, so he had to ship out. And then I hopped on the plane and, you know, went to Japan. I, I gave up everything. Yeah, and yeah. It, it wasn't going to be permanent. Like, the first trip to Japan, it was only supposed to be a two-week trip. So I had to decide whether to quit my job. because And this, this is for the second trip. The first trip, my job let me go. And it was easy. But the second trip, they're like, you just went and the second trip was going to be for a month. Yeah. And that's all they were committing to me was a month. Yeah. So I had to decide what to do. And I bet it all on black. I put it all on black. And I quit my high paying job. I sold my business child. I gave the keys to my new Mercedes to my mother. Yeah. And I hopped on a plane with no safety net to Japan for a month. I didn't know what I was going to do after that, but I knew that if I didn't take this chance, if I wasn't, if I couldn't believe in myself enough yeah. to just take this chance, then who else is going to believe in me? Right. So yeah, I'm down on myself and I went to Japan, honey, and end up staying for five, six years. Yeah, that's incredible. At this point, Kia, I must ask, are you a woman of faith? Do you have faith? Oh, I have lots of faith. You know, I'm a Christian Baptist. I believe in God. God is always. So you trying to make me cry again? Up, up. God, as always, you know, like they said, He may not be there when you call, but He is always on time. There have been times in my life where I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know when, and I don't know how, but I have never asked if. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've never asked if. I know that if I do my part, God's gonna take care of us. Why are you gonna be crying? Yeah, uh, I'm just, I, I'm just like I said. I, I, I pray before I get on these, uh, on these podcasts, Kia. So I pray for the, the right words to say. You know, I'm a Christian too, so you know it's very important for me to, to focus on that, especially you know taking this journey that you have because it seems to me all leaps of faith. You know, from the very start. And, um, you know, obviously God puts you in positions so that you can do good works once you're in those positions. So that's why I'm, I'm curious, you know, you had the fuel of the Holy Spirit there. That was, that's an incredible story. So, so you go for a month, you, uh, then they offer you a deal. So the, you're there, would you say five, six years you're in Japan now? Five, six years. All Japan women, right? All Japan women. Okay. I'm with all Japan women, but initially uh, Discovery Health Body Challenge TV show, the weight loss show that I was on, they had an episode where they had me do a surprise, they surprised China with me, or surprised me with China, rather, and she was training at the uh, New Japan Dojo in Santa Monica, okay. and so with the Inoki, so I, you know, I met Simon Inoki, and they said, anytime you want to come back and train, you can come back and train. A few weeks later, one of the Matsunagas, the grandson of the three Matsunagas, um, those are the founders of um, All Japan Women, they came out and were looking for girls to bring back to Japan. And so um, the Inokis called me up and said, they're, they're having a big tryout for you to go to Japan. Do you want to come try out? I'm like, hey, yeah. yeah. And I went, 
and it was um it was me and it was Shelly Martinez. Um and they chose me. Shelly Martinez was the more experienced person and who, and who I just assumed would get it. And against my mother's advice, she said, you never know what they're looking for. But she meant for like college auditions. And she would always say, you never know what they're looking for. So don't, you know, get down on yourself. And it turns out the reason they liked me was one, big black scary woman. And two, I was so new to the business that there weren't any habits that they would have to undo to do again. You know what I mean? So, because Michelle should be wrestling so long, they, I think they felt, well, that's what they told me, they felt that they would have to break whatever American habits she brought along for her to work, wrestle in that Joshi style. Yeah. And so they um, they picked me, they brought me out there, they named me Amazing Kong without telling me. Okay. So, you know, one day I'm coming, I'm coming to train over, you know, in Santa Monica at the dojo, and Shinsuke Nakamura, you know, we come from the same class. He's there, and he points at me. Never met him before. Yeah. Ever. I don't know who this person is, but it's Shinsuke Nakamura. He points at me, and he calls me calm. Yeah. And I just went crazy, because I'm like, in America, you can call the black women call. That's a big no-no. Yeah. And so, it was all goes to and so once we ironed out the you know the translation, he showed me in a magazine where that they had a press conference in Japan right. and an American was coming out and they had named me Amazing Kong. And so that's how I learned yeah. what my name was gonna be. And right. I was actually really upset by that because of all the racial um Inferences that that you know refers to, so I had to go home and think about how you know how do I take on this role yeah. of Kong without undercutting and selling out my race, mm -hmm. um, my gender, mm -hmm. my body size, mm -hmm. um, my my respect for myself of my beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how do I do that? How do I navigate that? Yeah, and I decided to make it my own. The twenty uh, NWA song had came on the radio, and I thought that they they were you know niggas with attitude, and if they could be niggas with attitude, I could be amazing. Calm, but I'm gonna have to make it my own. I'm gonna have to make it so people respect me and understand my journey, understand what I've been through, and flip the meaning of it. So yeah. that when you hear Kong, it's not a, a giggle, he, he, nothing. No, Kong, she's majestic. She's, you know, wonderful. Have you seen her? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had to stick that in my mind. And that's what I set up to do. Wow, that's incredible. Now, in Japan, though, um, obviously, because there's a language barrier, were you able to practice a lot with your promos out there? Was, was that prohibiting for you to do develop what that promos? for promos yeah. i think my in all my five six years in japan i maybe did that on the mic maybe four times five months wow. wow um and the first two three times they had to phonetically feed me what to say okay. and you know um, which was fine, you know, phonetically, all right, say it, you know, first one, they asked me a question, and I had to say Samui, which means cold, you know, and um, so the, it would win it that way, but as the years progressed, I did learn a Japanese, my friends would say I had the Japanese speaking level of a kindergarten first grade, all right. which I didn't take offense to, because I know some savvy first graders that can, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. where a lot of the facial features of Kong comes from, from having to use a universal language with my body. 
I was going to say it's that what a tremendous learning experience to develop psychology. I mean, ring psychology and even, you know, like you said, being able to portray the character visually as opposed to using words. That was an incredible learning experience then for you. Oh, everything. Everything there was a learning experience. And they made it very easy for me because they learn, everyone learns. I don't know about now, but, you know, 20 years ago, everybody was learning English in high school. So everybody wanted to practice their English with me. Yeah. So they made it. It was a very comfortable transition as far as, you know, it wasn't really like trial by fire or, you know, first yeah. by fire. What's the term? You know what I mean. But uh, it was very easy for me. I had to really push myself to like learn uh, to speak Japanese and learn how to read Japanese. I had to really apply myself because everybody wanted to practice English. Yeah. Wait, so, but when you were out there, did you enjoy it? Like once you got over the culture shock, did you start enjoying? I mean, because obviously there are parts there that are absolutely stunning, beautiful. Oh. So, yeah. Best five years of my youth. Mm-hmm. I mean, Loved it. Yeah. Never in when I first went, you know, for those first initial months when that's all it was supposed to be, and then it got extended a little longer. All my friends asked, Well, how long are you gonna stay there? Two years? I'm like, I'm gonna stay here no two years. Are you crazy? I'm American. I'm gonna be American. Yeah. But I fell in love with Japan and I fell in love with the, you know, the Joshi style of wrestling. And just all the places we went to, and um, most, and just I just fell in love. And I mean, when you remember your first thought that you have in the Japanese language, like I thought big for that for myself. I was like, oh my god, they spoke in Japanese. Say what? Like I just loved it. So it yeah. really became um for me. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So then, um, but towards the end there, obviously this, the, um, the time you're going to come back now to the United States. So what happened there? Did you get scouted while in Japan? Did someone call you from the States? Okay. Yeah. We were talking about, you know, spiritualism. Everything was going great. I was like at the pinnacle height of, you know, bookings and, bringing in money and whatnot, but something told me it was time to go home. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, it's not like God literally speaks. I hear like voices or nothing. No, I'm not Randy Orton. No, I'm saying like, I, something said, it's it's time to wrap things up. It's time to stop taking bookings. I had a, a newborn niece um, and I have five nieces and nephews, three mm-hmm. nephews, two nieces. Okay. And I've, I've always been there for them. I've always, you know, I helped my sister raise those kids. Yeah. So those are, those are like my kids. So to miss out on her infancy, it didn't jive with me. And it just seemed like it was time to come home and pursue, like, like, I, like I said, I was giving it five years. Well, now that five years is done. We need to pursue the actual goal yeah. which is the big show, the big stage. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's time to go to America mm-hmm. and get things done. Go be with family and pursue, you know. And so I always say plan your work, work your plan. A lot of the American girls were coming out to uh, um, Japan. So I was networking with them, especially Sarah Del Rey. She hooked me up with Shimmer. Yeah. And so with my first you bookies with Shimmer, I'm like, it's time to come home and get known on the Indies and really go for WWE. Yeah. So that's what I did. Got home, start doing Shimmer. Shimmer uh, blew up, started getting bookings. And within a few months, um, I hooked up. Sure. It's okay, Kia. It's a, like I said, you've had a tremendous, tremendous journey. So there's a lot to be, um, yeah, emotional about. Oh, sorry. All right. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Jerry Taylor, my good friend Ed, saw me and um, decided to invest in me and really wanted to pursue my, you know, further my career. And Terry Taylor was working with. Um, 
DNA. And so between him and Gil Kim wanting the female division to really explode, um, but low-key getting in Gil Kim's ear saying, you should try uh, this girl called uh, off Amazing Kong in Japan and then Terry Taylor and Ed trying to push my career up between that dynamic. I finally got the call for um, TNA and that happened. Yeah. Within a few months, three months. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fast. It's all coming to three. Gosh, gosh. Oh, you can say, "Yeah, sorry, I'm snotting all over here." <laughs> <laughs> I am saying, "You are making." Oh my god! You making me look like a car, Katie. Uh, okay, it's okay. This is this is your life. You know, this is your life story. It's a testament. It's a testimony. You know, this is your testimony. So well, I mean, people should know like my, my, sister, my sister just died, so I'm a little amped up anyway. But yeah, I'm sorry about that. Just looking back, um, there, there, I, I wouldn't be where I, I wouldn't have done what I've done and be where I am if it weren't for all the people who supported me mm -hmm. throughout my career. I had so much help, mm -hmm. and I, had, I just had so much help, and just saw opportunities opportunities at the right time and was prepared for them so when people ask me you know i want to become a wrestler what do i do I always tell them prepare yourself for the opportunities that will come your way you yeah. know because there will be opportunities to prepare yourself to grab onto those opportunities that's that's the best thing to do i'm sorry you didn't ask me that i'm throwing questions into this man's interview that's that's fine. No, that's fine because I want you to be comfortable enough to be able to do that. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's it's wonderful. Just uh, those spontaneous moments make some of the greatest interviews of all. So thank you for that. Um, so now you 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 you've got the contract. Now you're in TNA. This is at a point when TNA is is pretty darn red hot. I, I presume this. When was this? Like the mid 2000, 2007 ish. When was this time, Kia? This is two thousand seven. The okay. end um towards the end of 2007. Okay. September-ish, October-ish. Okay. And um they started a, a, a knockout division, a women's division. And um I had just got back from Japan and was like, I'm all for it. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. You know? So now when you got there, there were quite a few stars at that point in TNA. So who did you Let's just let's do this. Who would who do you like, you know, awestruck by? And then who did you bond with the most during your time in TNA? Oh, geez Louise. I well I think I was more awestruck by Kurt okay. uh, than anything, you know. And him being from Pittsburgh and my father being from Pittsburgh and stuff um, and him being just so nice. But also by the women I was wanting to be able to face. You know, Gil Kim is in this women's division, you know. Jackie's in the right. uh, women's division. Oh my gosh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I mean, giggle, giggle, giggle. Yeah. Because I've already at uh, Team 3D, you know, the Dudley boys were already there, but, you know, Aja and I had wrestled them in Japan, so I had my big, like, mark out moment back in Japan. So, you know, I'm feeling myself a little bit, like, I deserve to be here. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I behaved myself that way, but I was feeling myself a little bit, but, I mean, when I say marking out for everyone, yeah. because people don't know, but when I was in Japan, whenever everybody would come from America, I wanted to speak like real English so bad. I'd go to all the guys shows and be like, I just want to talk English with you. Yeah. <laughs> and they had these CDs of this pretty song um, promotion for TNA. And so when they would come back, I'd be, hey, you got some more of that TNA? I need some of that TNA. So when they were going to do women's division, I'm like, I'm all about that. And, yeah. and the way they visualized it from the beginning, hey, Good. Oh, um, the way they visualized it, I'm like, I'm all for that. And and if you remember, those were like some hot years right around 2007, 2008, 2009. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, there were a lot of 
big talent that came to TNA during that time. Wasn't uh, Mick Foley there? Hulk Hogan? Mick Foley came like a, a, a few months after I got there. Talk yeah. about, ooh, talk about marking out. I can't, yeah. I, I can't even, I have no words for how much I have modeled myself and my life as far as philanthropy and things after one Mick Foley. Mm -hmm. like, I want to be Mick Foley when I grow up. But yeah. It's my own. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible what Mick's done. You know, uh, he's helped yeah. a lot. I mean, certainly, if you look back at 1993 when he was Cactus Jack in WCW '94, I wouldn't have thought that he would have gone on to do all those one. And, and, and of course, we never knew the type of man he was back then. All we knew was the slightly off kilter character that he played. But in years past, he's done incredible. We want to talk about that for sure with you, Kia. Uh, some of those philanthropical things that you've done uh, thereafter. But uh, you run with TNA. It lasted how many years? Oh, off and on, five or six. Still, that's a leather long tenure right there. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, because I left and came back, left and back. So, but the, I think the original run was about two and a half, three years. Okay. Came back for like another couple of years, and then we dip my toe in every now and again, you know. Because TNA is like for me, it's like all of get family, me and there, your family, you know what I mean? Yeah, all yeah. Of our, so like always will come back to TNA or do something for TNA because it came into my own at yeah. TNA. And you know, when I yeah. finally went to WWE, in fact, like um, they. <laughs> Dollar and I just kept having to remind me to stop saying like you and uh, we because I would always like refer to WWE as you guys and okay. the TNA as we. Oh, and, like, yeah, they break me of the habit of saying that. Yeah, but TNA really is as as well as Jesse Hernandez and School of Hard Knocks, as well as All Japan Women. Yeah. It's embedded in my heart because I. Built blood in these places, and yeah. I grew lifelong friendships and relationships there. And um, I, I would never intentionally burn bridges in a place I left to move on to somewhere else. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But um, but when you did leave TNA, I should going back a little bit there. So when you were in TNA, obviously now you're getting you know a lot of international national exposure now so now you can interact a lot more with the u.s fan base what was it like for you did you have a lot of interest from young women did you do anything at that point like a make a wish uh were you talking to young women kids um not officially no because i felt that i still had a lot of work to do to get to that point where anything i do was impactful you okay. know now, I still did things, my own little thing, um, myself, but I always had planned, you know, my goal was to do bigger things with bigger companies and, and bigger uh, programs when I made myself a bigger name. I had to focus on plan your work, work your plan, make myself bigger so I can make a bigger impact in places that I needed. Right. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Well, you certainly then made an impact in WWE. So let's talk about that. Now you've made it to the company that you were that you were dreaming about back in the late 90s or early 90s, what have you. So what was that like? What was that day like? Do you recall that day when you got the contract offer? Um. Yes, because I got the contract offer while I was still sitting in John Laurinaitis's office. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had moved in with uh, my now husband, boyfriend at the time, um, Dan, up in, like, near Boston, Massachusetts. We were living, like, outside of Worcester and Princeton, Massachusetts. And I got a call um, from um, um, Tommy and uh, asking if he could uh, give my number to John Laurinaitis. Yeah. And, and I'm like, Okay, yeah. And then I get a call from, you know, the two one what is it? What's there? Two one seven. The the Connecticut the Connecticut area code with someone with a raspy voice claiming to be John Laurinaitis. And like I gave John Laurinaitis like 
a really hard time. I'm like, prove it. Who dare you? See, I mean, like, it's, it's the red. It's yeah. the red about belief. And so I, I forgot what I made him do yeah. to prove that he was who he said he was. So I'm like, I ain't got time for no uh, 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 BS. I don't have time for games. Yeah. You are not who you say you are. I will Jay and Silent Bob you and show up at your door. <laughs> she didn't use all that time. Don't get my hopes up and you're not who you say you are. Yeah. And he sent me an email and he was who he said he was. Yeah. And he invited me to come meet him down at the Twin Towers. And yeah. that was like in a month or so. So I, I go down there yeah. and we're talking. I get all dolled up. He's having a good time. And he showed me this like tape, like this, this this video of like what it is to be a you know a WWE superstar and it's clips of like this media and stuff and have fun and you know make a wish foundation and honey I had a full blown daydream yeah. in his office of me like in the ring and I'm holding up the whatever and and he's talking to me God is yeah. talking to me and asking me questions and I'm just glazed over from the video he just showed me, mouth probably open and just full on daydream. Yeah. And finally, I'm like, oh my God, I'm daydreaming. He's talking to me. I haven't answered him. He probably thinks I'm a moron. And I forget how I played it off, but I did. We talked a little more. And I, I can't remember exactly how he got into it, but he wrapped up the meeting with, Something, 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 something. And you came in and you looked real nice and you saw Perky and X, Y, and Z. And here, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm, I'm yeah, you're going to get a contract. And then he starts going into whatever. And I just like, I I, I believe I fell out my chair. <laughs> Not all the way, but I'm pretty sure I tipped over and had to like stop my, you know, and then they took me like, they let me go on a shopping spree and they have this closet with a whole bunch of WWE stuff, like, you know, the, the action figures. And posters and whatnot, and you can't let nobody like me go in there. I chose, loaded up my big suburban, yeah. and all kinds of things. I loaded up as pretty as I am. I gave them addresses to kids to send stuff to. Yeah. So I, <laughs> and they sent it to them. I mean, I, I, it was like, it was like the Wizard of Oz when it goes from black to white. Wow. That's a good that's a good way of explaining it. What a tremendous. And that was that moment, that realization. Okay, all that hard work now. And now you're over a decade in your career, right? This is 2012. Yeah. yeah, so now you're finally there. And um, but they did repackage you as uh, karma, right? It was karma. Yeah. Repackaged you as. Um, were you okay with that at the time, or did you have any reservations about change? No, they um, you know, this is when Triple H was just taking over, you know, the creative side of things. And he, uh, myself and um, Lord, what's that man name that kept jumping into the ring and put this in? Who's the one that kept jumping in the ring? He had a little trampoline. He jumped in. Oh, I can't even. Circle, what? the bamboo. Lord, y'all know who I'm. Your, Greek, your listeners know who I'm talking about. They remember what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, he was supposed to jump in the rain and he was getting this apart. Anyway, he and I uh, were like first thing, first projects for Triple H. Okay. So, well, Hunter asked me if I had, if I had a negative one, what I want to do in be in WWE. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, I, I didn't believe, I didn't believe him. I, I thought that didn't believe him. I didn't believe that if I said the new one that I actually wanted, that was like some kind of trick. Yeah. Let's know what you really want. So we make sure it never happened and we'll dangle like a carrot and stick in front of you forever. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, they want me to be something, you know. So I submitted all kinds of ideas that I thought they actually wanted. And no, well, he came back to me and was like, no, seriously, what do you want to do and want to be? And um, I gave him five names. One of them was Karma with the name. And, um, you know, when you get signed, you get on the road a few times, you know, a few months, weeks before you actually debut, you start traveling. And on one of those travel dates, he yeah, went to Vince and Vince said, okay, her name's going to be Karma. And from that, we kind of built what the character 
would be around like the name, yeah. you know, the Kong X essence, mm -hmm. but brand new revamped. You know how Madonna used to like remake herself yeah. every few years? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. At this time, are you, are you married at this time? Or are you still um, uh, is boyfriend, girlfriend? No, I, I, I am not married at this time, but I am not up un, un, unwittingly. <laughs> <laughs> I am a child unwittingly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but so, but uh, so, the, but at that time, obviously, you, you didn't get pregnant at that time. Uh, well, you were pregnant, but you you didn't. You, you know, you, uh, sadly, you had a miscarriage at that time. Um, but you, you did you take some time off during that time, or did you just continue to keep going? Um, I took a lot of time off. Gotcha. You know. Because what people don't understand that it was a, it was a late it was a late term miscarriage, and people always use the word miscarriage. And people always have this picture in your mind of like you know something that's little that you miss. You know, I I went through labor. Okay. You know, um, I had to deliver, mm -hmm. and we had to bury him. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when when you lose a child that way anyway um it's a natural it's a natural for a parent to bury their child so um i, w I went through a grief and i almost died you know i was in a hospital for a while okay um, i had to have blood transfusions and everything and like even then i i felt like i just want to go back to work you yeah. know yeah. uh if, if i could go back to work i would do better if i could just go back to work you know, not like to say it never happened or anything, but I can heal faster on the road mm -hmm. versus sitting at home. And that's all you're thinking about. Yeah. You know? so. However, um, depression that sometimes doesn't allow you to choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't understand. They hear the word depression and they think, oh, well, I mean, that you can just get out of bed. There were times where you literally could have walked in one of those briefcases from deal or no deal and said, there's a million dollars in this briefcase if you will get out of bed. Mm. And I would have thrown up a bird and put the covers over my head. Mm. That is serious depression. And just real quick, if you are suffering from depression, you are not alone. And it's okay to not be okay. Seek help. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Happens to the best of us, and it's okay. But you know, you do you. Go get that help. It won't last forever. Do the work. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. So, but um, you know, they wanted me to lose the baby weight and a little bit more weight, and it just was hard because I didn't want to really be around people. I I, I kind of wanted just to be on the road. I didn't want to, you know, they sent me down to Florida. They asked me what I needed. I told them what I needed. That's not what I got. Mm -hmm. I got, well, how about you do this? And I'm like, oh, okay. That ain't, that ain't gonna work, but um, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, literally, you can go off. I know where you send me. Yeah. That's not gonna work. Right. Know me. Tell me. You want me back? This is how we do it. Yeah. That didn't happen, so I kind of never came back. I mean, I came back for the Royal Rumble. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I was broken. And, I was broken and so. Yeah. Like, just imagine having to run a marathon broken ankle or something. Yeah. Plus, like I that said. That was me. Plus then at that, that time, like I said, you'd been on, you'd been working for over a decade at this point. So it must've been a lot of yeah, cumulative um you know pressure as well from the business so how did you deal with that was that a day-by-day -day thing or did you reach out for help how did you overcome that that time in your life i don't think i don't even know if i ever did mm -hmm. who says i ever did sure. seriously sure. Yeah. um there not a lot of couples uh with with stan not a lot of relationships with stan losing a child you know, and that was something I was balancing and still balancing today. Um, I have his, historically always helped and supported my family. Um, 
financially. And so there are a lot of demands and pressure on myself mm -hmm. that I felt I wasn't living up to mm -hmm. that were kind of unfair on me, but I felt I will, but, but you said, this is kind of what you set in place. You set them to, to be dependent on you. Now they are, you know what I mean? But now you're broken and, and, and you're in a camp world and a camp is something I've never even had simmering in my brain before. The word can't and can't was in my brain and I couldn't compute it. You know what I mean? I was like, it was like malfunction, can't. <laughs> Can't yeah. come here, you know, break down, break down. Seriously, and I was like, I don't even know how to function with this can't in my brain, mm -hmm. you know. And so just imagine being in a hole. Mm -hmm. We're going to throw out the metaphor and get off this. Yeah. Imagine being in a pit, a well, a hole, and it's smooth. And, it's, and you know it's smooth, so to scratch at it and crawl at it, there's no point. It's smooth. Right. You probably wait for somebody to come by and throw you a rope or a yeah. tail. All you're going to do is tie yourself out. And when help does come, you won't even be able to hold on to that rope. You know what Just I mean? Good analogy. Yeah. Needlessly, you know? And whatever that metaphor is doing, y'all, is apt to what was going on yeah. in my life. Okay. No, that's very true. But it's also, again, coming back to faith in God, coming back to faith in Christ. It's the same thing. You know, sometimes we can try, try as we may. We can flail our arms around in, you know, an, an analogy I had heard many years ago was, you know, if you're in the water and you start flailing your arms around, well, you're going to start attracting sharks. So, you know, you, you, as difficult as it is sometimes, some of the best is just to stand still. Mm -hmm. and we hear that we read that in the Bible to be still and know that I am still. God. So, you know, yeah, very much so. So you learn that. So really it was a a time of, you know, I guess sharpening your your faith in many ways. Um, yeah. You know. And I, I wish I had been still. I just wish I had been still and taking care of myself first instead of just just trying try, trying to be rocky and just mm -hmm. keep getting up and keep getting up and keep getting up and failing. You know what I mean? Just they're just taking care of myself and and did did the right thing by my to, for myself. Did yeah. right by me. I should have did right by me and I did not. Right. Okay. But you did manage to eventually, you know, because you did go back out on the independent circuit. Of course, you did go, you were in a AEW for some time as well. What was that? A couple of years, two, three years you were in AEW? Round about, yeah. Yeah. So you have been there. And then, of course, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about your appearances on Glow. That was a huge success on Netflix. It was it was a well-produced show. I was just telling my wife about it this morning. Um, so how did that come about? And obviously that was interesting because you loved Glow as a as a youngster. And now you're actually playing one of the characters on Glow. So how did yeah, that come totally came through Yeah, yeah. Sam is real, y'all. Um, so Brian Wittenstein, who many people know in the wrestling business, is um, he's worked for TNA, WWE, X, Y, and Z. Um, he became a Hollywood agent, and when he was at TNA, you know, when we first met, and you know, he asked me about myself and let him know about my acting background and my aspirations to become an actress in the future. And so when he, him and his company saw them casting for Glow, he called me up and he was like, you know, can you like get us to show Glow? And, you know, I'm a good player. Yeah. She went out first for the role of Cherry and um, didn't get it. But what I sent in, they really liked what I sent in. So they, the producer, and she you know, Liz and Carly, they said, you know, we want, can she read for this other part? And, you know, so then. I, I read and got welfare queen, you know, and it, it was, it, it was a blast. Yeah. Man, and Glenn was just so fun. Talk about another, you know, bunch of family to add into my family, my social family tree, my urban family tree. Yeah. Glow and my glow sisters. Yeah. Very, very special part of yeah. my life. 
Yeah. Is there any, and perhaps any rumors of a, a special or, or a reunion? Because what happened? Because it was, it seemingly it was doing very well. So why was? Oh, well, I, I don't quote me on this. Now we are going off of rumors. Okay. I don't, this is what I've heard. So I don't want nobody coming after me talking about you. Know, I know. I don't know. This is what I heard. Right. Um, that the, you know, the new, they got some new executives or, you know, people over at Netflix and they have like a new algorithm with different shows. Mm -hmm. And then with, um, we were already in the midst of shooting season four mm -hmm. when the pandemic hit. We had already put one episode in the can and was working, all, we were in the middle of the second episode yeah. with the whole world just stopped. Yeah. And they put all the sets in storage and whatnot. And when the pandemic happened, it became all about like the bottom line and how long did it take to keep these sets in storage? Um, how would a show where you have uh, shots where you have crowd shots and then you have stars who have to be like literally in each other's armpits and crowd yeah. during yeah. the pandemic? How? What kind of guidelines do we follow or create? You know what I mean? Yeah. How do we do this? Is it worth it? I guess we, they said not. And yeah, yeah. Took yeah. the rose up under it. Yeah. I, 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 it was too bad because this season, the way it was explained to us, the way Liz and Carly, the producers, had went over the story arts. Oh, as a TV junkie, honey. Oh, <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh! The TV. The yeah. world missed something, y'all. I'm sorry. You yeah. missed. You missed something. Something yeah. was stolen from me. I <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a shame. Like I said, it did get critical acclaim. It was certainly well produced. It certainly it made you feel like it was the '80s. I mean, the 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 production values were so incredible. Um, and it came at that time with Stranger Things too, because it was kind of around the same time that Stranger Things was really great, gaining its promise. Oh yeah, but there it, were times where they used props that were for real, like from the '80s, and it actually smelled like the '80s. I'm an '80s baby, and yeah. I was like, oh my god, that just took me back to you know, yeah, crazy, insane. Everything. The color. The clothing, the costumes, everything was done to perfection. I, I grew up in the '80s, so I, I remember. Also, it was it was really well done. So then that came to a close in 2020, and then, but at that time, were you already with AEW, or were you just starting out with them at that time? Um, I had just started out with AEW towards the uh, a few months before we started. Um, no, no, actually, almost like a year before the pandemic. So, like a big height of 2018, I think. Okay. Um, or 2019, yeah. At the beginning of 2019, right from the jump, when it, okay, whenever AEW started, okay. like for real, for real, yeah. I was there. Okay? okay. And then in the middle of the, um, I had to leave for a little bit to go shoot Glow. And then while we were shooting low, the pandemic happened. And um, because of certain um, ailments that I have, I could not travel. And um, God bless them. They paid me way longer. AW paid me way longer than I thought they would or should. God bless them. Yeah. Um, and we just, we just parted ways because, you know, I couldn't come back. And why keep paying someone like I I agree. We we parted amicably, oh, seriously. That's, that's like, I mean they paid me way longer than I would have paid somebody. <laughs> I'm just saying. So yeah. Uh, that's good. But you officially ha are now retired, uh correct? I mean the wrestlers ever really retired. I mean uh, you know, just kind of <laughs> <laughs> You're just taking a respite right now. Oh, yeah, there you go. I'm retired from. Okay, I'm retired from Friends. Okay. There it is. I'm retired from Friends in Wales. Okay. 
There you go. There you go. So, so but now how are you enjoying your, your, your time off here? So now, cause you mentioned, so obviously you, you, you're still doing some things, right? You're still out and about, you're still doing signings, things of that nature. Eventually, um, I'm actually reciprocating the support um, my partner gave me and with his business right now. Okay. So, um, you know, when we met, he trained dogs with, um, he trained dogs for people and soldiers with disabilities. Oh, wow. And, um, but that was on the East Coast in Massachusetts. And since we moved out here to California, to do glow um he uprooted himself and started his own business um doggy daycare and doggy training um so i'm supporting him and managing that right now wow you yeah know, has to be give and take yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but very nice though i mean what a transition to be able to now work with animals it's very peaceful you know dogs we love dogs we've got a dog it is it, it, it is it's very peaceful it feels to me it's very peaceful i mean i don't know about you but Again, if you look at it, if you look at it spiritually, Kia, it's a time to rejuvenate. It's a time to rest. It's time to it really eat. Is. It's a time to, you know, dogs are a fantastic. I'm, you know, you hear so many dogs they support and they really help people. You know, we've seen even this with uh, what do they do it with inmates and stuff? Where they bring, yeah, they're therapeutic. You know, they're very they're therapeutic. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, that was the amazing story from the amazing Kong. We hope that you enjoyed today's episode and we ask that you kindly subscribe to the channel, like and share these videos. It helps us spread these inspirational pieces so much further. Until next time, Victor what you must Victor in your life. This has been Victoire.